Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we're joined by Lewis Giannis from WealthNet Investments in Denver. Lewis is one of my favorite strategists. I heard him speak uh, a number of years ago and just loved how he described his process. He's going to walk us through sort of the U.S. versus non-U.S. picture, small versus large, all these key relationships that in a lot of ways, I, I would argue, rely on the course of the U.S. dollar. So we're going to talk about the chart of the dollar and what that means. Also, do a bit of a deep dive into the materials sector. This is sort of a forgotten sector that I would argue potentially has some more weakness in store. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome back or welcome to the final bar. This is Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. I think the sun has thrown me off a bit for my, uh, for my intro comments. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together, focusing on the message that the markets provide. There's so much speculation about what the market should do, what a sector or an industry or a stock or a particular asset should do given some headwinds and tailwinds that you hear. Technical analysis is focused on what the markets are actually doing. And I always tell people, if you do nothing else, if, you're, if your idea as an investor is to listen to a bunch of commentary and focus on the news and think about what should happen versus looking at the charts and analyzing what actually is happening, I think the latter focusing on the message of the charts is by far superior. I would argue as a holistic investor, as a well-rounded investor, you're doing all of the above. And you're thinking about how the charts, the supply and demand, the fear and the greed relate to the big picture, relate to things that you're reading and things that you're hearing and seeing and combine all of those to, uh, to have a decent, well-rounded investment thesis. Now, it's not just me helping you along the way. We've got some great guests coming through the show. I'm excited to have Luis Giannis back on the show today uh, to share his perspective on, uh, on big picture uh, through here the, the first quarter and, uh, and beyond. Tomorrow, we have Leslie Juflas. Uh, Leslie's a fellow CMT uh, based here in the Seattle area. She's the founder of Trading Live Online. It'll be good to have her back on. Next week on Tuesday, we have Javed Mirza. Javed is uh, the technical analyst at Canaccord Genuity in Toronto. And then on February 11th, uh, another guest, Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip Daily is going to be coming back on the show. So some great guests coming through to help us make sense of these markets together. Let's get to our market recap. So if you follow the market today, certainly some distribution going into the close. Overall, we finished stronger. The S&P just above the zero line, closing around 38.30. But it was at uh, you know sort of a new swing high above yesterday's high about two, about an hour and a half ago as we're recording this right after the close, but really sold off going into the close. And, and again, I, I would hesitate to draw too much of a conclusion from one day, but I can't help but notice the last couple of days while finishing positive, that's good. The last hour has been more distributive. And if you know, if you think about the trading day, the last hour is when you get reallocations. That's when you get institutions, uh, you know, moving, moving money around. And so the fact that you're seeing distribution going into the close in general, sort of back in my head, feels more like, uh, feels more negative than positive uh, as an input. However, you can't deny the continued uh, you know, increase in prices. And this week, we've seen successive higher closes until that changes. I mean, it's certainly telling you that the market is netting out to, uh, to a net positive move. The NASDAQ actually was uh, negative with the NASDAQ 100 down 0.4%. So you have a bit of a dispersion between the NYSE composite up half a percent, the uh, NASDAQ 100 down 0.4%. Uh, the VIX is actually lower today, back below 24, just below 2350, actually. Um, sorry, very quickly, mid caps and small caps. Mid caps flat, small caps actually the best of the bunch, uh, actually had been negative earlier in the day and rotating more positive. So there's a bit of a, of a divergence between uh, large and small uh, today, actually, which is an interesting theme to pay attention to. Small, you actually you have a lot more financials, you have a lot more um, interest rate sensitive uh, parts of the uh, parts of the market. Uh, the 10-year yield back higher today, back above 1.1%. The TLT down about 0.9%. That's our general proxy for bond prices. And the dollar index essentially flat using the UUP as a proxy for that. Looking at some uh, other asset classes continuing on, gold flat to down, silver back higher. Silver, obviously a lot uh, of, a, of a tension in that asset after the, you know, sort of discussion over the weekend about a, a, about 
Um, some some new participation in the silver market, sort of finishing uh, higher today, but not too much higher. The DBC continuing to push higher. And if you take a step back and look at the big picture view, we're going to uh, dive into the material sector a little later and look at some of the groups that make up that sector and what the charts are telling us. But it's hard to deny that the DBC, the commodity index overall, just in a, in a pretty decent uptrend with some notable choppiness. But overall, the, the trend has been positive. I, I see that essentially continuing on. Uh, for the near term. Cryptocurrencies continue to uh, push back uh, up after the pullback in uh, Bitcoin and others. Bitcoin coming off of the all-time high of 42,000, now back closing just above 37,000. So continue to chip away, uh, pushing higher on all the uh, the top 10 cryptos that we track at stock charts all in the uh, in the green today. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500, sort of re uh, recalibrate uh, on where we're at. So there's a number of themes to, to pay attention to. Here's the overall sort of general sense of how I'm seeing things. So you had the consolidation in September, October, you had the breakout in November, and that essentially has continued unabated until about a week and a half ago, maybe a, a week ago. And this is when you broke down through this trend line of support uh, finally. And this is the trend line taking the October low, the December low, and then we tested that a couple of times there in January before the breakdown. So you know, in my opinion, when that sort of things happen, that, that, that happens on the tactical time frame, on that shorter time frame, I tend to lean more negative than positive until we, you know, essentially reclaim those new highs. We break to new highs. We get to 3,900 on the S&P. I will absolutely tell you that was a, a, a brief hiccup before we continue higher and the path of least resistance remains positive. I, I, until that happens, though, I feel like we're sort of in chop around mode. What's good and what's relatively easy if there can be a thing as an investor about this particular sort of pattern is one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to break to new highs and make a new swing high above the mid January, late January peak, or you break down through uh, last week's low from Friday, which was 3,700. That would push us below the 50 day moving average for the first time since October. And that would indicate further, uh, you know, further downside potential increased uh, chances of for the downside, if there's a line in the sand where you'd say, "What's the level that I would that I would start to turn more bearish?" and it would be for me about 3650, 3630. That would be the lows from December. That would be the 38.2 percent retracement of this October to uh, January move. If we remain above there, I think overall, e even if we're pausing and and uh, correcting in terms of time, the price damage is not too severe. If we start to break that. I think the potential of us retesting something like 3,200 has to be considered. Um, first things first, you have to get below some of these interim uh, swing lows. We've not done that yet. So first things first, the 50-day moving average, we remain above that. And uh, things certainly seem uh, relatively uh, relatively stable with, uh, with downside uh, cushioned uh, for now. Looking at some other, uh, other parts of the, uh, the market and today and, and how they've evolved, energy in the number one sector uh, going up uh, about 4.3% on the uh, on the XLE oil prices were higher today, and that's certainly driving things. Communication services, number two, and the number one stock uh, in the S&P for much of the day was uh, Alphabet. Kind of came off just a little bit, uh, but uh, finished the day uh, just below 8% higher, about 7.6% higher. You have some other stocks here like EOG and uh, Fang, uh, which is Di Diamondback Energy. And you know, again, if you look at the chart of something like this, you know, when I'm thinking of, you know, the market environment overall, it's like a chart like this. It's hard to not feel pretty constructive about. It's been this beautiful pattern of higher highs and higher lows. There have been pullbacks, which have felt severe at the time, but every pullback remains higher than the previous pullback. And that is the definition, that is Charles Dow's definition of an uptrend. Higher highs and higher lows is an uptrend. So these swing lows that keep getting higher than the last one overall is a very constructive pattern. So something like Diamondback, obviously a nice rally today, uh, pushing it back higher, but but overall setting up pretty well. You know, the chart of Alphabet, it, it, again, it, out of all the, the fan mag stocks is what I call those six sort of mega cap uh, communication consumer uh, technology names. Uh, you know, Alphabet has certainly been the strongest out of those six, I would argue, in terms of just a consistent uptrend. Well, most of them have been sort of in the wilderness, sort of in a choppy sideways pattern, uh, like a, a Netflix comes to mind or, uh, or others. Uh, Google has essentially just continued to push higher, pull back to its 50 day, kept bouncing off of it. Now has certainly resolved uh, to the upside. You know, a number of the these stocks have reported earnings last week or this week. So we're seeing a decent reaction to those. But uh, overall, pretty good, uh, pretty good move there uh, after earnings this week. Amazon's the other one. Amazon, arguably the opposite. 
with the chart of Amazon, obviously the news last, uh, you know, this week was, was less earnings and more about, uh, you know, a change of uh, a, a, a new era of sorts with, uh, with, the, uh, with Jeff Bezos stepping down or, or beginning the process of stepping down. Uh, and, and, you know, when I'm looking at this chart again, that, that's outside the scope to get into too much of the news driven impact of this, but just looking at the chart, what you see here over the last 48 hours is a stock that has gone from a consolidation phase, lower highs, higher lows, literally a coil pattern, which is a narrowing of range, really rotating around the midpoint around 3,200 for, uh, for Amazon. We tested the upper end, we bounced off the 50 day, broke out. And then today you have again, what's called a bearish engulfing pattern. This is not a positive things for, for stocks. When a stock breaks out of resistance and then immediately has a bearish engulfing pattern as the RSI is at 60, for me, that confirms more of a range bound environment, confirms more short term weakness than strength and overall suggesting limited upside on a, on a stock like this. So you have this interesting barbell effect of uh, or, 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 or dispersion of sorts, a differentiation between alphabet gapping higher and, and, and breaking to new highs, continuing this uptrend pattern, something like Amazon failing to break out remaining range bound and showing some short term weakness and, and limited upside momentum. Arguably, that's what causes a, a market to not just drive to new highs. This is more of a consolidation phase style market. I think that's why you're seeing some of the breadth indicators continue to come down. Um, I think that's why you're seeing uh, sentiment that had been euphoric coming off a little bit, but overall, I'm not seeing the signs of raging, you know, long and strong unlimited upside. It's more cautioned and it's more ride trends that are working, but not be chasing things at this point until you see how these sorts of things uh, evolve. Uh, something like uh, Amazon pulls back to a 50 day and keeps rotating higher, um, then uh, then absolutely the, the, the trend remains more positive. That's our market recap for today. Again, a lot of moving parts. Just wanted to touch on some of the charts that are top of mind as I'm reviewing the action of the day. Let's, re let's take a quick break. We'll be back with Luis Giannis. We'll see you in a minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to have you join us every weekday after the close as we review the technical themes of the day, try to make sense of these markets using the language of technical analysis. As a reminder, we're here to help you along your own journey of analyzing the markets, making investment decisions, trying to improve your routines and your decision-making process. Any questions that come up along the way, shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com, on Twitter at finalbarsctv, or on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We'll do another mailbag segment at the end of this week on Friday's show, and we'd love to answer one of your questions on the air. I want to welcome on my guest uh, back to the show today, Louis Giannis. Louis is the founder of Wealthnet Investments based in the Denver area. And Louis, as I, we were talking about before the show briefly, I remember hearing you present years ago at a, at a CMT conference in New York. And I was just so impressed by mm -hmm. how you described your investment process, how you went about it. So I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here joining us and sharing some of that expertise with our, uh, with our viewers. Welcome to the show. It's glad to be back. I'm glad to be back. Thanks. Thanks so much. Now you sent some, some fantastic charts really talking about, I think one of the themes that a lot of investors are trying to, trying to understand, which is this rotation between different, uh, different market forces. Start us here. We're looking at the U.S. versus some non-U.S. indexes. Walk us through your perspective here. Yeah, you know, I think right now a lot of people are um, focusing too much attention on the micro and not looking at the macro. What what this chart shows is a multi you know, multi-cycle business cycle chart. So you can see the gray areas. Those gray areas are all recessions. And what I wanted to point out was the top chart there is the U.S. market represented by the S&P 500, and then we have the emerging markets in the middle, and then the uh, developed market, which is mostly like Europe. That middle chart is mostly China. So it gives you kind of a perspective about, you know, the overall global stock market. And the thing that is really interesting about how the global stock market works is that you have these big cycles and waves when uh, U.S. does better than, than international and international does better than U.S. And if you look at the prior cycles, you could see periods of time where we underperformed dramatically relative to international for long periods of time. And then you go, it goes the other way. 
Now, the most recent cycle that we saw, you know, coming after the financial crisis, you could see that the U.S. stocks strong were much. The U.S. stocks were much stronger than the international stocks. The international stocks uh, went sideways, not making a whole lot of progress. But what's interesting, we are in a different scenario now. Many stocks in the United States are overextended and are very extreme in their valuation. The CAPE ratio, which, you know, is, is at four and a half times normal values. So we're at like around 34, which we haven't seen for, for a long, long time near the dot-com bubble. So you, you've got that scenario. And then you contrast that with what's going on in the international markets and with a new administration that may be changing policy relative to China. And the picture is really changing. You're seeing that in the technicals. It's fascinating just looking at where we're all at relative to, you know, sort of that 2007, 2008 period. And it's just a clear, you know, differentiation between the U.S. market just in this strong uptrend versus EM, which is literally just reclaiming those previous highs, right? Exactly. So from a classical charting uh, perspective, you if you do a measured move, you know, you have a lot more upside in these in emerging markets and uh uh, developed market stocks uh, as, as, a, as a group. And we're more bottom up in an orientation with, with a cognitive, we try to stay cognizant of what's happening in the big picture as well. But when I pull back at the big picture, it, to me, it looks even clearer what we're seeing underneath the hood. Last time I was on, I talked about how small caps look a, a lot more attractive on a bottom up basis. And we saw that uh, come to fr fruition. And I think that's going to continue too, which is uh, also part of this equation. No, it's a great segue into your second set of charts, Lewis, where you're looking a little bit more at relative performance of some of these groups, starting with small caps. What, what are you seeing here? Yeah, I mean, the basic thing is it's the same. Uh, it's just an easier way to see what I had mentioned in the first chart. You could see the ratio chart tells you which one's outperforming the U.S. market. So you can see the small caps this cycle. They started out this past cycle we saw you know, after the crisis. Small caps started to outperform, and then they really took it on the chin, right? And they've 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 come to a bottom. But earnings have have made continued to make progress. Now, you mentioned in your last segment that there's a lot of financials in there. That's a big part of this because uh, if and I don't have this chart here, but if you look at the ten and two treasury spreads, that's widening, mm -hmm. and that widening started, and and you're starting to see the financials look really attractive smaller financials. So uh, I think that you can continue to see small cap outperform. And I really think with new policy and valuation adjustments to the emerging markets, you could probably see outperformance in the emerging markets as well. I'm looking long term here. And fundamentally, we're seeing that as well. And uh, you also mentioned that the dollar has a big part of this. I totally agree with you. Uh, I think the thing to look at is oil prices, the dollar and gold. And, and that's going to really take, we're at an inflection point. I should probably should have put that chart up here. But if you look at that, it really is telling you, that we, we got to see what's, how that resolves. But if that resolves in, uh, with the dollar falling and uh, the precious metals going up and oil continue to going up, I think you're going to see these, uh, an even more pronounced uh, uptrend in emerging markets and uh, developed markets. It, we only have about 30 seconds left, though. This is, this is fantastic. I, I, you've given everyone, I think, a lot to think about. We, in particular, you mentioned... Uh, you know, the two 10 year spread, right? The shape of the yield curve sort of steepening, right? Which, uh, and, and 10 year yields increasing. I mean, overall, given what we've seen, is that is that sort of growth in financials, especially the small cap financials, is that the end of last year? Was that last year's story? Or is that a, a pattern you see continuing? Is that some somewhere you'd still look at opportunistically? Well, I think it could continue. A lot of this is going to rest on policy. So uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to be watching policy, the treasury a lot, and I'm going to be watching the charts. And the dollar, and the, like I said, I think those commodities slash currencies are going, to, are going to be the big clue. That's fantastic, Lewis. Listen, it's so great to have you back on. I, I, I always wish we could have so much more time to talk because I think you have such a great perspective. But thanks for joining us. Hope you and the, those around you stay safe and we'll talk to you again soon, all right? Thank you. That's Lewis Giannis. Lewis is the founder of WealthNet Investments based in uh, Denver. And, and, and hopefully you get a sense just from a couple of minutes of hearing him describe how he's thinking about things. One, one of his comments that I loved, he said something about kind of like I'm a bottom up investor, but I'm cognizant of the big picture or something along those lines. And, and again, regardless of whether you are trading, you know, E-minis or, you know, some some broad uh, index or future uh, you know, I think there's so much to be gained by looking at the stocks that comprise those uh, those indexes. There's so much information to be gained from that. And if you look at some of the ratios that 
uh, Lewis was sharing there at the end. Those are the types of big picture rotations that will that will not necessarily be reflected on sort of the index chart, but you'll see how assets are rotating between sectors, between styles, and uh, and so forth. So some, a lot of great things to uh, to think about there. Our next segment is called the sector deep dive. What we love to do with some uh, regularity is, is dig into a particular sector and just sort of dissect some of the themes. And again, we have limited time on a show like this, but just to start to, to help you understand a little more about a sector and what it means. So often we're, we're sort of looking at the top level, at the high level of a particular sector and summarizing something like technology or financials as one thing, which granted it can be if you're, if you're a sector allocator, if you're doing a sector rotation strategy, but today we're going to talk about the materials sector. And that's one, again, we sort of group materials all as one thing. But if you look at the groups that comprise this sector, there's some, there's some different things at play here. You have gold and uh, gold stocks, mining stocks as part of this. You have chemicals, specialty chemicals, commodity chemicals. You have the steel names, the aluminum names, all sort of mixed together in this, uh, in this one sector. So what we're going to do is look, look at the sector performance overall, look at some of the individual groups and stocks that make up that sector and see what sort of conclusions we can start to draw about where they're headed. Now, the material sector, so you know, it's usually sort of off the radar of a lot of uh, investors, especially a lot of institutional investors, because it's such a small weighting in the index. So I don't have it in front of me, but I would guess the material sector is probably two to 3% of the S&P 500. Compare that to something like uh, consumer discretionary or technology, which are like 20, 25% of the index, at least 10, 15% at the, at the least. So, you know, the, you have these larger sectors which really will drive the index movements. Then you have something like materials or real estate, uh, which are really more of like a, a rounding error. The old telecom sector, which was essentially AT&T and Verizon, which was a classic example. That was just a, such a small sector. So it was easier to just ignore it and focus on the other things where you had more levers to pull. Having said that, when something like materials does well, it's a great opportunity because it's off the radar of a lot of investors. There are opportunities in there that people probably aren't noticing. And getting into a theme before it catches on is a lot of times uh, a really uh, really good approach. Someone, and I forget, I'll, I'll look up who says, someone said the, the goal of investing is to have people, everyone agree with you later. Uh, and that's kind of what you're trying to do when you're looking for something that's emerging as a relative outperformer, especially an unsung hero like materials. So the story of materials has been actually relative strength since the March 23rd low. Prices went higher. It broke above its January high here in July and just kind of continued in that nice steady uptrend through the first week in January. It's been a rock star sector. However, that all changed in the last uh, in the last three to four weeks where you've seen the relative strength come off. You've seen the XLB rotate back below its 50-day moving average, while a lot of other sectors are sort of still holding on. The XLB has actually broken down. So question number one for the XLB, for the material sector, does it is that breakdown of the 50-day moving average a temporary phenomenon before it rotates back and start, starts to aim back to retest those highs around uh, 77, 78? Or does it break support around 70? You can see it's pulled back and basically 100% retraced down to its December low where it tested a number of times. The 70 level is a pretty key one. And if it's breaking that, that's kind of a concern. And I think you then have to look back down to the 200 day moving average, look down to, down to the September, October lows, sort of the uh, a similar thing to the S&P going down to 3,200. Again, that's what that would mean. That would be a pretty steep uh, sell-off, giving back a lot of, uh, of the gains from 2020. Now, to dig into a sector a little more deeply, I'd encourage you to use the in industry summary page. What you do for that is click on charts and tools, or from your dashboard, you'll see a link in the upper left for the industry summary page. That gets to this. I usually look at the table view. I usually sort it by scooter rankings, which puts the strongest uh, sectors on a relative basis, or the strongest industry groups by sector. Uh, so it puts them all in order. We're going to zoom down here to uh, the materials sector, which is here. And you can see that it's comprised of uh, nine different industry groups. And it's some of the ones that I mentioned, things like steel and aluminum, non-ferrous metals, uh, mining and gold mining stocks, uh, chemical stocks, and, and a couple of things. And then you have things like paper, containers and packaging uh, sort of round out the group. We're going to just look at a couple of different groups and hit on some of the names you may be familiar with or may not be familiar with in, the, in each one of those and, uh, and look at what we can see. We're going to start with the uh, the non-ferrous metals group. The reason why we're going to start here is FCX is one of the large cap names. It might be the only large cap. It is, yeah. I was going to say it might be the only large cap stock in this group. A lot of these materials, uh, the material sector is not a big one, so you'll find a lot of mid cap and small cap names, names you may not be familiar with because they're not S&P 500 names, 
uh, most likely. But FCX is one stock that a lot of people have followed because of this incredible run of relative performance. You saw the relative strength in the material sector. This, as one of the large cap names, has been a, a pretty decent contributor to that uptrend. You can see on the scooter large cap rankings, it's 97th percentile, which is you know top 5%, top 3% really of, uh, of, uh, of large cap stocks. That's pretty decent. That means it's had a pretty strong long-term trend. And when I look at the chart of FCX over the last year, I see a great example of where the RSI has been in a bullish range. When a, when a stock is in a healthy uptrend, it becomes overbought during upswings. The downswings, when it pulls back, the RSI rarely gets below 40. That's sort of the general characteristic of a healthy bull market phase. So you can see in December, became overbought uh, here. You can see January first week of the year, it became overbought again. We can see on the most recent pullback, it's testing its 50-day moving average, the RSI not getting below 40. So all else being equal, a chart like that, finding support at its 50-day and bouncing higher, the RSI not getting below 40, that reminds me a lot of last September, which was a, a an actionable pullback, a buyable pullback, if you will, sort of buying back on short-term weakness, long-term strength, short-term weakness, and we ride the, uh, the stock to new highs. Arguably, we could be setting up in a similar sort of pattern right now. So out of the sector, FCX isn't a bad uh, a bad opportunity, opportunity, I would think, in terms of technical setup. So, you know, a breakdown of the 50 day, a breakdown of that most recent swing low would certainly invalidate that as a uh, as a decent thesis. Now, what's that? that? That's the group at the upper end of the spectrum, sort of the strongest uh, group, non-ferrous metals. FCX is the large cap name in that group. What's on the bottom? Well, it's things like gold mining and, and, and uh, mining stocks. And again, not a lot of cap here, meaning it's a lot of uh, small and mid cap names. Newmont Mining, NEM, is the one you may be familiar with. And if you think of the chart of the S&P 500, you think of the uh, technology sector consumer, the fan mag stocks, what they look like. This stock looks very different. Newmont Mining was, believe it or not, one of the top ranked scooter stocks coming out of the March low. It's kind of funny now thinking of it, looking back, but March, April, May, this is one of the strongest names, top five, top 10 uh, stocks. And then from there, it just got, uh, it just got uh, pretty painful. Made a new high in August, but from there, it has been a slow and steady downtrend, lower highs, lower lows. And you can just see this trend line taking these highs. Until that trend line is broken, I think it's hard to uh, to buy into a name like this. You can see it hasn't become overbought since the end of July, meaning the uptrend has not really brought in a lot of buyers to push the stock to uh, to new highs. It's been in a downtrend. Overall, the path of least resistance is down, in my opinion, especially given the relative strength that overall has been uh, deteriorating. In general, owning stocks with improving relative strength and not owning or leaning away from stocks with a declining relative strength overall, I found to be a good way to outperform a passive product outperform the S&P uh, S&P 500. We don't have much time uh, to dig into anything more. This isn't much of a deep dive. This is more of a shallow dive into there. But the other thing is I would point out would be aluminum stocks like AA Alcoa. Um, the other one would be containing containers and packages. Some things like uh, th something like PKG is a good a good example of that. And then the chemicals. Uh, sector, something like Dow is a good, good example. And again, overall, those charts have been relatively challenged. I think the sector as a whole is safe for something like F FCX with a nice setup. There are a lot of charts that look more weaker than stronger. Uh, so it's worth digging into some of the mid and small cap names if you're looking for opportunities. We need to wrap the show though. Go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the 10-year treasury yield. I thought uh, my guest, Luis Giannis, did a great job uh, sort of describing the potential for something like the financial sector. When when people tell me interest rates, quote unquote, can't get much higher, I always love looking at, uh, you know, thinking of how people told me interest rates couldn't get much lower when we were back here and making a new low for the 10-year in February. And you can see, obviously, we could get a lot lower than a lot of people thought. The trend in the 10-year is higher. The slope of the yield curve is increasing. And overall, that speaks to the strength, uh, potential strength in the financial sector. Now, the other key macro theme is thinking of the strength in the dollar. And you can see that the, the dollar environment has been weaker rather than stronger. Now that's changed. And if you start the clock at year end, it's been a very different picture. I think the dollar continuing to strengthen from here. If you continue to make higher lows and higher highs, which we've started to do on that tactical time frame, that's a very different environment that many of us have been used to. It's worth noting maybe the RSI, which is just above 60. Does it hold there or does it continue higher and become overbought? I would argue that I would actually be more of a constructive dollar pattern to, uh, to observe. Finally, the chart of gold. If you, if you looked at the chart of Newmont Mining moments ago, the chart of the GLD is very similar. And again, I think the, the overall trend there is trendless to down until proven otherwise. Folks, that is our show for today. Special thank you to Luis Giannis 
joining us from Wealth Method, WealthNet Investments. Great take on the overall environment. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.